This content is sponsored by Los Harengo. I never get it right. Tequila. Los Harengo. Los Harengo. You Los know, your Italian's, your Italian's getting better, but your Spanish definitely needs work. It's available it, now at the LCBO for $63.15. Los Harengo. Keep your eyes open for a limited time offer where this might go on discount, but even at full price, it is worth every penny, and we are very grateful for their sponsorship. Los Arengo. You're listening to Two Guys Talking Wine with Michael Pincus and Andre Pru. This podcast is sponsored content. And while we are grateful for the sponsorship of Los Arengos Tequila for supporting Two Guys Talking Wine, the views and the tape were all taken by us. And we were thrilled to have a chance to visit the distillery right down in uh, Mexico. Hello, Michael. Andre, we went to Mexico. <laughs> and we lived to tell about it. <laughs> yeah, we did. We went to Mexico and we tasted tequila and we talked to people who made tequila and we talked to people who own tequileries. Uh, I think you just call them distilleries. Oh, all right. Okay. Like it, 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 it was, well, I mean, it was like a really, really interesting trip because like it's, it's something where, um, you know, I, I, like I said in the last episode, I think for the vast majority of Canadians, uh, their experience with Mexico is heading to resorts. And this is not to, not to poo poo on resorts. My parents love going to resorts. My brother loves going to resorts and I get it. Like it's a nice place to relax. But for me, like, when I travel, I really love having an opportunity to experience the culture and what we got to do, you know, spending some time in, in Guanajuato, uh, which was a beautiful city. Um, very walkable. Very walkable. Well, yeah. yeah, you and I went for a really long walk w- one day just because, you know, we we don't really speak the language and it didn't look like Guanajuato was big enough to have a robust public transit system. No. Uh, but no. I mean, at the very least, like I, I felt very safe, which I think is important to me. And, you know, it's one of those things where I think the perception of Mexico off resort is something that can be a little anxiety inducing. Um, it, it is definitely a place that's on the, the list to revisit. Uh, yeah, we stayed at a, a lovely little villa, I, and I wouldn't call it little, but it was a lovely villa, and uh, uh, it's just, uh, I, I was kind of surprised, because you always hear people saying, you know, don't go don't go off resort, don't go off resort, and I, I, it was, I again, felt totally safe walking down, uh, I wasn't always checking my pockets to make sure that, you know, no one's, you know, pulling something out of it. Um, people were friendly. Uh, again, we don't speak Spanish. Uh, although some of the French may have come in handy to understand a little bit of something. It definitely did. It definitely did. Uh, I mean, especially when we were doing some of the tasting seminars and, and just getting around the, the distillery, you know, you start to pick up on certain words over and over again. And if you speak French, uh, I will definitely say that you will likely be able to follow a conversation. You want to understand everything that's going on, but you'll know they're not making fun of you. Or you think they're not making fun of you. <laughs> All right. So the second part of this, we want to get into the history of the Los Arangos brand. Because apart from the fact that the, the brand is named after Pancho Villa, this really great uh, Mexican revolutionary, uh, this hero of Mexican culture, we got to sit down with Don Leonardo. Um, that is not his full name. Like Don as in, like Don is is the Spanish word for boss. And everyone yeah. called him Don Leonardo everywhere we went. This like tall um, Mexican man, a little bit older than we are. He was always well dressed, wearing you know well ironed pants and nice shirts. And um, it, it was just really cool to get a chance to sit down with him and hear his and hear his story. So we got to hear in in his words um, what the Los Arangos brand means to him. Eh, buenos días, eh, soy Leonardo Rodríguez, eh, toda la vida me he dedicado a, a vinos y licores. The reason of doing uh, Terra Terra Los Arango is the family name that we mentioned before, Dio de Dio. It was uh, Pancho Villa, and he's a famous, famous uh, revolutionary. 
in the past that made history in Mexico by fighting for the independence. And the horse over there, you see, it's a replica of the horse that he was riding when he went up to north to defend the, their revolution. So, basically, Doroteo Arango is the family name, Arango is the family name for Pancho Villa. Los Arango. Dándole mucho toque al honor de Los Arango, a la familia de Los Arango. All right, so the voice that you heard translating there is someone we're going to be talking to in the next episode. That is Rafael Berardi. He is the CEO of Fraternity Spirits, which is the parent company that makes Los Arango. You know, I, I found Don Leonardo to be very uh, forthcoming. Yep. Uh, and he was very uh, generous with his with his time. Yep. Uh, he was there both days Yes, uh, that we were there. And uh, we were told that he would only be there one of the days and uh, that he showed up. Uh, we had lunch with the man. Yes. Uh, again, very, uh, very generous, uh, very, uh, very welcoming. Uh, always had a smile on his face. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, if I, owned, lot. if I owned a tequila distillery, I'd be smiling all the time, too. I, I thought the same thing. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, he was very, um, very welcoming uh, to us. So we, we thank him for his hospitality. Uh, and also, you know, letting us drink a ton of his tequila. Yeah. I, well, okay. So one part in the clip that we just heard about, uh, like the, the beginning of, of Los Arango and where the, the brand comes from is that Don Leonardo has been the owner of the distillery since 1996. So it, it is, I guess, relatively young when we take a look at some of the other spirits brands that are quite established on the market. But it's also, you know, if you walk up and down the shelves of the LCBO, you can see a lot of these brands didn't exist all that all that long ago. So it is kind of interesting to see, you know, like when we talk about Pancho Villa and the importance of uh, weaving Mexican history into the fabric of the of the brand. Um, but, you know, when you acquire a distillery, I don't see that being an easy acquisition. It's, it's certainly not something that is is cheap. So, you know, Don Leonardo talked to us a little bit about um, how he came to become the owner of uh, La Sarango Distillery. And, and you have to understand that it's not just the distillery, but it's the hacienda where the distillery is located. Oh, yeah. It was built in 1730. So it's not a young building in any way, shape, or form. We're looking at a, a, at a place that has been around a long time. And it turns out he got very fortunate. In reality, me estaba esperando. Eh, estaba eh, en muy malas condiciones. It was yes. a moment, a magic moment, because uh, yeah, the, tenía, the property was uh, already tenía, abandoned tenía, and, tenía, and tenía. the banks had already taken uh, possession on that to uh, uh, to take it in as the collateral that they had to use. And uh, it was a magic moment because he came just in the right moment at the right time and he could take the possession on it by paying for, for the debt that the Hacienda had at that moment. I, I don't think anybody gets the idea of like, you know what? I'm going to go and buy a distillery today. Um, there's a really interesting backstory. Don Leonardo actually has a history of distilling back in Spain. And he told us a little bit about that part of the backstory. Lo que pasa es que estuve vi yo viviendo en España cinco años. Prior to uh, start here with uh, the Hacienda, he was five years in Spain, and uh, as, a, as a producer and the mindset of developing, developing product, he developed with the peyota, which is uh, what the porks, uh, the wild porks eat to may to yeah so it's like a, a, a nut it's like a nut and they made out of this fruit a liqueur in uh, spain and uh, the producers and consumers around there or friends were saying oh you're coming from mexico you should know how to do tequila but how can you come here into spain to teach us how to do a liqueur out of piota which nobody has done in the past so it was a success uh, in spain because of the novelty of the 
of the product, and that was his starting point when he came back here to uh, Mexico and uh, the liqueur. He mentioned it as part of the history. He connected it to the history. And when he came back here, it's when, uh, when he started. Entonces, yo andaba buscando una fabriquita de tequila para llevarlo para España. He came back from Spain. He arrived here and uh, a few friends on the lunch and, uh, were uh, joking about that uh, you can do tequila in Tamaulipas and, uh, and in some areas that were already newly uh, assigned for denomination. I said, no, I, I can't believe I'll bet on that. And uh, he let a uh, few people to investigate where uh, where the possibilities are. And uh, one name came up, it was Penjamo. And uh, Penjamo, uh, he related it to his, uh, his Spanish uh, uh, time because uh, there is a song of uh, from uh, Pedro Jimenez, which is called uh, Ya Vamos Llegando a Penjamo. And they were singing it in Spain. So Pedro Infante was the singer, and he invented that song. And the Spanish people knew that song, and they were repeating that when he was with them, joining uh, the days. And so when he came back here, and with after the lunch with the friends, and they made the bet for a dinner, if there were, he would not believe that uh, this area was only tequila, uh, Jalisco, for making tequila. And then. It started, uh, all the venture started there. Okay, so I can confirm that the word that uh, that Don, Leonardo, and, and Raphael were looking for is acorns. He yeah, was the, making, the, uh, the, he, as you said, the porks eat them. The pigs eat the acorns, and he made a... Liqueur uh, out of them. Some sort of liqueur from acorns. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we looked up what this uh, liqueur was, but... Uh, um, I wasn't I able. I wasn't really able to. Relative. Yeah, I wasn't able to find it because I, I did take a minute to look it up. Like I was able to uh, to transcribe parts of this podcast to make sure that we could do some some fact check on it. But uh, you know, it it it's the thing that kind of blows my mind because like I think everyone looks for a certain amount of like comfort and success, right? And in this business, in the alcohol business, it is very difficult to be successful. Once. Uh, and, and and Don Leonardo was successful in Spain. So why would you pack up and, and leave a successful business in Spain and and come back to Mexico? Primero que nada, yo por eh, para soy fabricante de licores de toda la vida, pero el tequila para mí es un respeto. The story that uh, he has starting as a producer, tequila, why not being in Spain and coming back because his origin is Mexican and his passion. Uh, was focused on having a product that represents Mexico. That represents the, the core, the essence. And Mexico was known in globally, is known for tequila. There we go. Just like we said in episode one, tequila is part of the Mexican identity. Yes, and he came back because he was Mexican and he wanted to be part of that fabric of uh, of the land and he wanted to um you know uh, uh you know it's it's fine to to run off to spain and and you know do something different there uh but it was really interesting to you know he's successful once in spain and then he comes back and and is successful now in mexico as well so as you said when when you know you're successful in one place you usually just kind of stay in that place but he wasn't just happy to sit on his laurels he comes along and he goes you know what i'm i'm now going to get into the tequila business because in my heart and in my soul and who i am uh, is mexican you know but this is this is where the interview i think got really interesting to me because uh you know you can go into a, a market and decide to make a product and you know i i think there's ways you can definitely definitely cut corners um, if you take a look at when we talk about my experience with tequila in my university days in Saskatchewan, there were in, in, in the early to mid 2000s, there were two brands available on the shelf. And that was Jose Cuervo and Sauza. And I'm sure the people back when Don Leonardo acquired the distillery in 1996, 
that it, it might have been tempting to pull a Jose Cuervo and just find a way to make as much tequila as possible, export it as much as possible. But I can tell from talking to Don Leonardo that that wasn't good enough. That having a respect for the production, a respect for the culture, and a respect for the product was really important. But you don't need to hear me say it. Let's listen to what Don Leonardo had to say about that. Entonces es un... The respect that he has for the production of tequila and the house to build the house that uh, with dedication, with the dedication that he has started the production of tequila, finding the right place and then starting uh, looking at the right soils uh, to produce uh, agaves harvesting the best possible agaves with the right sugar contents and uh, give the process the necessary time to go into uh, uh, the cooking process, then into the fermentation, then into the barrels. The barrels that you see is uh, the best possible barrels to get the flavor is the American oak, and, uh, and that uh, is charred by them as well in-house to make the thickness of the wood and the burning uh, exactly as they would like to have it. Como ustedes son campeones en, en la... The, this passion and the dedication to create the perfect liquid and to connect it with the history and the way of doing this program, you have never the chance to sense all what you see and feel at the moment here at this place. So he invites after the perfect program that you will do to invite everybody to visit the Hacienda because that gives you these five senses that we try to transmit over the radio, over the communication, and uh, that is inviting. This seems like a good time to uh, remind our listeners that this is a, uh, a sponsored uh, content uh, by uh, Los Aranjos and that we thank them very much for their sponsorship of Two Guys Talking Wine. You can grab it at the LCBO for $63.15, unless it's on a limited time offer, which it may very well be by the time you're listening to this podcast. If you are used to drinking your tequila with salt and lime, don't. Take yourself on your back patio or your balcony or somewhere that it's warm outside, Fill your glass up with ice and have yourself a nice sip of La Serango Tequila Reposado. You won't regret it. You know, listening to Don Leonardo talk about his passion for quality, I always find it inspiring when you meet people, whether they're 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 tequila makers, whiskey makers, or wine makers, when they really just care a lot about the integrity of the product. And this is something where um I, I want to talk about something we learned about, and we're going to break it down a little bit more about the different types of tequila. We're going to get into some more specifics in the next episode because this episode's more about the, the the history, but really great tequila. And Los Arango tequila, if you take a look at the front of the bottle, it says 100% de agave. And when you are going up and down the shelves of the LCBO, keep an eye open for that. Because these are the high quality, the artisanal tequilas, because 100% of the spirit comes from agave. The stuff that I was drinking in university that wasn't making me feel so great, it turns out this was something called mixto, which is a mix of agave and sugars from elsewhere um, that you know is, I, I think, definitely of inferior quality. At least that's how it was explained to us. Yeah, and that's that's why a lot of people had bad experiences with tequila and the old you know the old adage of one tequila two tequila three tequila floor uh is because sugar is carried to the bloodstream quicker and <laughs> that makes you feel drunk um and so we've all you know been there if you maybe maybe have had too much let's bring it back to wine port or ice wine or something like that uh, you're feeling a little more lightheaded. Sparkling wine has that same effect because of its sugar content and the carbon dioxide in it. But if you are drinking real, honest to God tequila, there is uh, where is it? it's 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 less than one uh, percent sugar after fermentation. So it's it's there's not a lot of sugar in tequila. 
We, and, are, we are still advocating responsible consumption. Correct. But like but, it, it, it's it's clean. Like it leaves a clean feel. Like it's ref- honestly, like I know I read it as the commercial read, like like the ad break in the middle of this episode. But like drinking that really good reposado and the anejo, which we're going to talk about in the next episode on ice, was refreshing. There's no guess, way. There's no way that 21 or 22 year old Andre would ever think that. Hey, you know what's going to be a refreshing drink when you're 40? Tequila on ice. Yeah, we actually um, just again we'll get to it in the next one. But we uh, uh, at one point finally, when we got a chance to, you know, get back to the villa, uh, we had it by the pool, yep. uh, and it was a, on ice, and 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 at no point, again talking to twenty one year old Andre, would I believe that he would say to himself, "Oh, you know what would be great to sit by the pool with." A tequila on ice. Yeah. So bringing us back to our interview with uh, with Don Leonardo, like now that we've established a little bit, you know, the history of tequila, and I think what most of our experience with tequila in Canada has been due to brands in the market. Like if you walk down the the aisles of the LCBO, it is loaded with a lot of new brands of tequila, and I think like this this new renaissance is really great. But you know, you need to be careful when you enter a market and it becomes saturated very quickly because you don't want to end up in a situation like Beaujolais where thanks to the the whole Beaujolais Nouveau craze, it took them like damn near 40 years to rebuild the reputation. I think even now we're just kind of on the tail end of that whole Beaujolais Nouveau thing. So we talked to Don Leonardo about how to make sure you protect the integrity of the the brand and, and and protect the quality of tequila through like artisanal uh, artisanal manufacture. Was really easy, but uh, but I said, look, we so the passion that he mentioned that he has for the production and the way he uh, uh, watches over each particular part of that production and the way that uh, foreign companies came and have bought properties and production facilities uh, worries him because those people are not living the passion that he thinks needs as the special ingredient to be a good tequila. In this boom of tequila that has been, there are financiers who are very good for the finances. As the base for the growth in the future, the respect uh, for the production and the work that is behind it, the passion. If that is not the ingredient there, the industry will be falling into financial giants that will just uh, commercialize without passion. And that is one of the part that he wants to keep alive as long as the industry, and that's the ingredient that he feels uh, needs to be for the future of the product. What I equate uh, Don Leonardo to is, and, and, I, and I guess let's bring it back to wine because that's, you know, we are two guys talking wine, and, and I know I understand that we are two guys talking tequila at the moment. But think of a, a, a Canadian who goes abroad and learns a lot about uh, making wine, uh, wines from, let's say, Australia, uh, New Zealand, Chile, gets all kinds of um, experience there. Let's say they went to France and Oregon, and suddenly somebody says, come back and make Chardonnay and Pinot Noir here in Canada, and they get very excited about it and end up defining what Canadian wine can be in its terroir and its forms. I think you know who I'm talking about. Are you making a Thomas Batchelder reference? I, I am. I, start, I started off uh, esoterically, and then I went, oh, well, there's a guy who has done that. And that's that's kind of what we're, what we're talking about here. We're talking about somebody who went out, learned the distilling process and, and, and the, how, to, how to be successful distilling something in another country and then realized that he should come home and and protect his homegrown essence, I guess is, is the word, uh, and his homegrown uh, birthright. Let's call it that. Yeah. I, I mean, like this is once again, I, I think one of the big themes uh, from all three of these episodes that are going to be out is that 
enjoying tequila is a, a way of enjoying Mexico when you get a chance to to bring it home. And, and I mean, this really came through with with Don Leonardo's um, passion. I've said it two times already talking about the Canadian experience with uh, with resorts and, and Mexico, which I mean, let's face it, is a diluted version of the culture. But, you know, I asked Don Leonardo if he had a message for Canadians, especially Canadians like me, who maybe had experience with mi- Mixto in the early 2000s when that was what was available to the market and you know talking to him about how excited we were and the opportunity that we had to visit the dist- the distillery and uh, this is what he had to say in Canada esa pasión me encantaría que viniera a verlo aquí porque eh, hay una zona so the one one uh, the point is uh, looking at by uh, transmitting the way of passion is to invite all Canadians that have the possibility to travel, and especially with a community like in Puerto Vallarta, which is very, very close, there is an Italian-Canadian. They have built buildings and buildings, and they've sold most of them to uh, Canadian uh, uh, immigrants or uh, visitors, and that's their retirement place. And uh, he would love to organize through the communication, a special uh, trip organized with tours uh, with the boss to bring them here so they can have this five cents all together at one place because it's the only way to really perceive what you try to communicate through the radio. It's not super easy to buy plane tickets for like all of my my friends and family to head down to uh, Guanajuato and go visit the Los Rango uh, distillery. So the the best I can do is try to become an ambassador uh, by doing exactly what like what you said, Michael. I I did steak and tequila when I got uh, got back off the off the plane. But that being said, I am looking forward to. I I have talked to my my wife about heading down there so that she could experience it for for herself. Um, you know, one of the nice things about Mexico is it's not a super expensive place to visit. The dollar does go very far. I walked into the country with a, a, a pocket full of pesos that cost me a hundred dollars Canadian, and it went very far. So, a pocket full of pesos—that's I don't know. It sounds like an album title. Did are we doing some songs later? Um, I got a pocket full of uh, pesos. Anyway, um, I I would agree. I I I think you were doing a lot better when when it came to the um, the the exchange. Uh, cause I was like, I was still, I don't know why I was lost during, during the whole exchange of, <laughs> of that. And then I think by the time we got on our walk, I was like, whatever it costs, I, I've got the pesos in my pocket. So I'm not really, uh, really worried about it. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I really did find that, um, if, if, if you do go and I, I would recommend that people go to, and I can never get the name right. Gua, Guantajo. Guanajuato. Guanajuato. Um, see, my, my pronunciation is terrible still, um, that it is, and I can't stress it enough. It was a safe place. Um, you know, I, I get the, the going off resort is, you know, scary to a lot of people. Uh, but even our hosts, um, who, who did do a little bit, a little bit. Uh, poo pooing about you know going off resort in uh, the the touristy areas, stressed that their area was very safe um, and and not to be worried. And and Andre and I did you know put it to the test. We were two guys walking the streets, uh, just you know out there, and we look. I I'm gonna say we looked like tourists. It's we not did. like we had tourists written across dude, our did, chest. Dude, dude, like we're we're, we're two big white guys walking around the streets of Guanajuato. Like, and, and, we, and you know, we somebody would say something to us and we're like, we do not speak this language. Oh. So, um, yeah, it was, it, 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 so to, to, I think to really understand tequila isn't to buy just anything off the shelf. It is to look for something that is authentically Mexican and authentically, uh, agave. agave. Yes. And, um, I mean, we, we came back to like, maybe the concept of vintage variation doesn't exist and maybe the concept of terroir in terms of you know individual agave fields doesn't exist but there's definitely something that makes tequila special 
Es todo. Es que es una pregunta muy general, ¿eh? Es todo. O sea, creo que no podemos fallar una cosita. Es lo que lo que estoy diciendo. Es todo. Mira, ¿qué ocurre? Yo he hecho ron. He hecho you can do with grapes any type of uh, spirit. You can do with the potatoes. Uh, you have uh, raw material for the whiskey. Uh, you do the malt, and you have all everything you have available during the year. You can harvest and you can produce it. But there is only one product in the world that takes seven years to grow, to be processed. And if there is not the dedication and the value for the product and the dedication for all the details, as we explained it during your visit uh, in the production, that makes the product outstanding, those details. Uh, it, is, it is important to, to note that there are 30, and I found I found this very interesting. I don't, I don't know if, if, you, if you did, Andre, but, but there are 30 species of agave, and it is only one blue agave that they make tequila from. Um, otherwise, it is that misto stuff that you you had, you had mentioned. Uh, and that, that the blue agave actually has a scientific name. It's agave tequiliana Weber. Which I, I was wondering how the Weber came in there, but maybe it's because you, you grill it. I'm not sure. <laughs> Anyways, when you're heading to the shelf of the LCBO, make sure you take a look for 100% uh, agave. And in particular, you should be grabbing a bottle of the uh, sponsored tequila of this podcast, Lesser Nango Reposado, available for $63.15. The LCBO number is 47316. You can catch that in the show notes to find an LCBO near you where you can grab a bottle of this. Yeah, we'll link it uh, link it down in the show notes. And again, we'd like to thank our, thank the sponsor, uh, Los Arrenjo for uh, for um, uh, uh, taking us down to Mexico and, and showing us uh, some real Mexican hospitality, uh, Mexican food. And on that note, um, yeah, we we, we 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 we've done all this talking about the history of Los Arrenjo. We've talked about how it's made. I can't believe we've made everyone sit and wait for the third episode to hear about. What does it taste like? Yeah, and uh, and how it goes with, you know, food. Not just Mexican food, but food in general. I really had uh, had a blast going crazy with um, ordering, you know, the, the, the great offering of authentic Mexican cuisine while we were down there, including one night where uh, I tried to find us the most authentic Mexican place that I could near the uh, near the hotel. But, um, yeah, I mean, if you can wait until tomorrow, we're not going to make you two weeks. This mini series is rolling all throughout the week. Get you ready for your weekend. You sound like that DJ. Which DJ? Everyone from the 70s. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe to Two Guys Talking Wine on iTunes. Two Guys Talking Wine is produced by Jim Ray, Adam Duran, and Ken Little.